So it's my pleasure today to introduce our first speaker, George Crabtree, who's the Distinguished Professor at University of Illinois at Chicago, Senior Scientist and Distinguished Fellow in Material Science Division at Argonne National Lab, and Director of one of the new energy hubs, the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. But that, all of that only begins to describe what an uh, amazing set of accomplishments George has. He's won many awards for his research, including the Caroling Honors Prize for his work in high temperature superconductors. He's a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. But I, I also uh, want to express how much the Department of Energy depends on him, because, because this is really quite remarkable, having done some of this myself. But he has led workshops for the DOE on hydrogen, solar energy, superconductivity, materials under extreme environments, basic science for energy technology, computational materials, and chemistry for economic competitiveness. And he co-chaired the undersecretary's assessment of DOE's applied energy programs. What would they do if they actually didn't have him? I, I can't imagine. So, so uh, Pat, Pat, uh, Pat Damer's right-hand man and has, has, and, and has made enormous count. And then on the side, he actually does something like this for the NSF as well. So I, uh, I, I want to express my appreciation for how much uh, George has done to, um, for the planning of condensed matter physics in the largest sense and materials physics in the country. It's, it's really, he's a national asset. And he's also the only person to be a keynote speaker on this topic. Uh, so uh, so uh, with great pleasure, I introduce George Crabtree. Well, that was quite an introduction. I wish I had uh, all the power that that implies. Uh, but I have to say it was a pleasure, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I thank the organizers, Mike and others, for inviting me to such a uh, well-organized conference and with, in a sense, the right people. So uh, although Jay Caesar, the energy hub that Mike was referring to, is only about three months old, depending on how you count, and we're now into our, we're out of the startup phase and into the research phase, uh, not a lot of people know, what's, know our story. So I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to present our vision, our mission, some of the things that uh, we're gonna change in the battery R&D world. Uh, and I would welcome your feedback uh, at the end when we have that opportunity. So you can see up here, let's see, yeah, uh, our logo, which stands for electricity. Don't ask me exactly what, but I think you can get that feeling from that visual. Here are the messages that I'd like to deliver. Uh, and I'll, the whole talk is right here. The opportunity for energy storage in transportation and in the electricity grid, it's unusual to find two such large energy sectors, in a sense, waiting for a transformation. The outcomes that we expect to achieve with our energy hub, they go by our signature sort of tagline, 555. It means five times the energy density, one-fifth the cost within five years. Uh, and I want to tell a little bit about why we have chosen to be so aggressive. Those are very aggressive. But beyond that, three legacies, I'll tell you what they are. Uh, and uh, we hope that these will be transformational for the battery R&D community as well as for the uh, batteries that we produce. When you're going after such a big goal, you cannot uh, rely on uh, conventional technology. So lithium ion batteries are the best batteries we've ever seen. Uh, they're everywhere in our pockets and in our cars, and uh, you know they're growing by leaps and bounds. They get better at about 5% per year in energy density, and if you're looking for a factor of five, you won't find it uh, in lithium ion. So we're looking exclusively beyond lithium ion, so a new battery space. Uh, and we bring some distinguishing features, and I want to say a little more, actually uh, elaborate on something that Mike was saying earlier. Uh, about how Jay Caesar is a microcosm of the DOE uh, basic science and applied uh, energy effort. And I'll show you that. I think it's really quite a testament to Steve Chu, uh, who gave us such a wonderful talk yesterday. And in fact, this is his brainchild, and he gets a lot of credit for it. I think it's a brilliant and a bold idea. OK, so let's launch. Um, so here's uh, the energy that we used in 2009. And the two biggest features there, if you see, are the yellow transportation, 
the grid, which is divided into three, handling about 40%. This is about 70% of our energy. Both of those sectors are waiting for it. They're ripe for a, transfer, uh, a transformation. In transportation, it's replacing foreign oil with domestic electricity. So a lot of good things will come from that and reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the process uh, and diversifying, in a sense, the transportation energy chain instead of relying on one thing, oil. You could rely on electricity, which comes from lots of places. Uh, but it needs energy storage for that to happen. The second uh, opportunity in electricity, 40%, so the transition from coal to gas, we've already heard something about uh, being driven by uh, lots of shale gas around, low prices, uh, concern for the environment. That's half the battle. The, other, the rest of the battle is to go all the way to wind and solar. Uh, lots of states say that we should have 20% wind and solar by 2020 or some other such RPS. Uh, and there's plenty of uh, wind and solar out there. We could easily supply 30%, 40%, 50%, and lots of people say even more than that, up to 80%, from the resource that we are blessed with in the United States. So these are the two uh, opportunities, and the, the bottleneck for both these transformations is energy storage. So we, J. Caesar, was formed to go after this opportunity in a very special way. Uh, we have transformational goals, so five, 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 five times greater energy density than today's commercial batteries. One-fifth the cost, do it in five years. These are very aggressive. Uh, and everyone that I present these goals to says that. Oh, they're so aggressive. There's two answers to that. The first is that's the opportunity. That's what you need to be transformational. So you could say, let's do something that's lower risk. Let's shoot lower. Uh, maybe take a factor of two or a factor of three. Yes, it wouldn't have the transformational impact that a factor of five is, uh, would have. So in both uh, transportation and the grid, you have to compete. You have to compete in transportation with gasoline-powered cars. They have about a factor of five better range, many of the inexpensive ones. Uh, and in the case of the grid, you have to compete with uh, backing up solar and wind with gas uh, turbines. So you need to get uh, the energy density up. That's for trans transportation and the cost down. Uh, that's for the grid. Uh, so that's the first answer. We've put the challenge on the table and we're going after it. The second answer is take an envelope, turn it over, and a pencil, and ask on that envelope, uh, what would happen if I did the best I could do theoretically? If I got all the breaks and I achieved the theoretical expectation for energy storage? And you might be surprised at the answer. It's a factor of 10. So in that context, a factor of five, about half the theoretical expectation, that's what many mature energy technologies get. So in that sense, it's within reach. It's just a question of finding the new phenomena, storage phenomena and materials beyond lithium ion that will get us there. So there we quantify exactly what we mean in numbers. You can read that. There are also three legacies that we'd like to achieve. One is a library of fundamental knowledge about beyond lithium ion energy storage. So we want to understand at the atomic and molecular level the uh, phenomena and the materials of energy storage. And this is something that is not normal in the battery community. You're usually more concerned with does it work. If it works better than what we have, we'll replace it. If it doesn't work as well, we'll throw it out and we won't try to understand why. So this is a new feature a library of fundamental knowledge. The second legacy are two pre-commercial prototypes, one for the grid, one uh, for the car, that will achieve our 555 goals when scaled to manufacturing, very important. And the third one is equally important, a new paradigm of battery development where you put discovery science, battery design, and pre-commercial prototyping all in the same organization highly interactive, talking back and forth across that spectrum, uh, and accelerating the uh, progress to, uh, to the next generation battery. So um, here's the battery community at the moment. It, it, there are two parts to it, the science community and the technological, the engineering community. Each one is pretty effective, but they don't talk to each other enough. And that uh, discussion in the vertical direction between the two communities is what we want to attack 
as our third uh, legacy. Uh, here is what J. Caesar will do, our visual. So on the left, you see the basic science, discovery science. We have three ideas, which I'll tell you about in a couple of slides, multivalent intercalation, chemical transformation, and non-aqueous redox flow, all of which are capable of contributing to this factor of five improvement. Uh, but more than we have a cross-cutting science team which supports the fundamental research on those concepts. We have systems analysis and translation. We'll be building a battery on a computer. Uh, and uh, depending, and we'll be modeling for cost and performance. And if we have, let's say, 16 ideas that emerge from the left, from the basic research, we'll model them all. Maybe four will be uh, ideas that we want to send forward, they'll be the best four. The other 16 won't work for some reason, won't work as well. And this modeling process will tell us why. It'll tell us where the link, weak link is. And we'll send that information, that challenge, back to the basic science side uh, and say, make it better. Uh, and then we'll do cell design and prototyping. We have another innovative idea there, overseeing the, the prototyping with a translational development team, as we call it. Uh, which is made up of representatives from all four elements you see on this uh, graph, that is basic science, uh, uh, battery design, of course, prototyping, and commercial deployment, uh, so that any issues that arise or opportunities that might be missed uh, can be identified and sent in the right direction, either back to the basic science folks for further work or uh, preparing for commercial deployment. So there's a dotted line on the right between cell design and prototyping and commercial deployment. We won't do, the center won't do any manufacturing. It's not our job, we don't have the resources for it. But we have commercial deployment folks and manufacturers on our team to keep us informed. So here's the team. It's rather large and I think very impressive. Five national labs, Argonne, Lawrence Berkeley, Sandia, Pacific Northwest, and SLAC. Uh, five universities, University of Illinois at Chicago, University of Chicago, Northwestern, University of Illinois at Urbana, and University of Michigan for their automotive connections, and four private sector partners chosen strategically for the value they bring, Dow for its materials uh, uh, knowledge, and especially high throughput materials, which we would like to adapt in the center, uh, JCI, Johnson Controls, the largest battery manufacturer in the world, mostly lead acid, uh, they wanna, they've got a catcher's mid ready. They want to take what we develop and perhaps uh, get ahead of the next generation of battery manufacturing. Applied materials actually uh, makes most of the semiconductor processing equipment uh, uh, for the industry, and uh, that manufacturing challenge is much the same as batteries. It's lots of thin films, films on films, interfaces. You have to have film architectures. We'd like to benefit from their experience and their thinking maybe we can apply our uh, uh, semiconductor knowledge to a new field uh, if it looks good. And finally, Clean Energy Trust. It's a um, nonprofit um, in Chicago, about four years old, that promotes entrepreneurship. And we believe there will be many opportunities for entrepreneurship, startup companies and innovators uh, in Jay Caesar. And we'd like them, we've asked them to coordinate venture capital, bring venture capitalists and innovators together, uh, and generally manage that part of our program. This is all bragging, so I'm not gonna read it, but everything that our partners have done in the last 10 years, uh, having to do with batteries, you can see some of the things there and take a look at it later. But the team knows uh, what it's doing in this space. We have more about, so that we have 14, the 14 partners, including Argonne. We also have affiliates. So I think the number is up to 45 now. These are organizations that don't get any money from JCs or nothing from our contract with DOE, but they uh, care very much what we do. So things like private companies, venture capital firms, trade organizations, research universities, and uh, very importantly, Energy Frontier Research Centers. There are five of them that are battery related and we've already had uh, one big meeting with them to plan how we're going to cooperate in attacking this space. So these folks are interested in what we're doing. And we imagine, for example, having a big uh, workshop every year. We invite our affiliates. We have our J. Caesar folks explain what they've done in the last year, what they're planning to do in the next year. And we fully expect some of our affiliates to hop up and say, see, you're working on XYZ. I'd like to work on that with you. I know something about it. I can make you go faster. Or 
when I, I'd like to work with you on that. When you're done with it, give it to me. Let's start talking now so that we can see what the transitional uh, issues will be. So we want to bring the whole community up with our, with our effort. So I mentioned before that there are three concepts, and here they are, multivalent intercalation, chemical transformation, and non-aqueous redox flow. Let me tell you very briefly, and I'm sure this audience will understand instantly exactly what they are and why they're valuable. So on the upper left, you see a typical lithium ion battery. A lithium ion oscillates between the anode and cathode, stores energy, releases energy, has one charge. So why don't you replace that lithium with an ion that has two charges, like magnesium, or three charges, like yttrium or aluminum, and double or triple the energy density in one fell swoop? So that's the first idea. Second idea, chemical transformation. So instead of having intercalation at the anode and cathode, so in graphite, for example, the layers spread out a little bit, the lithium ion goes in, the lithium ion comes out and the layers shrink, uh, you store some energy that way, but you can store a lot more energy with a true covalent chemical reaction, a covalent bond. Uh, so why don't you uh, replace the intercalate host with something that actually reacts with it? Examples are lithium with oxygen, lithium sulfur, sodium sulfur. These things have been around. There are lots of other opportunities besides those. So you can get a factor of 10, for example, in energy density on the back of an envelope with this approach. The third idea is non-aqueous redox flow. So why don't you take that solid electrode and replace it with a liquid? So when you have a solid electrode and a, and a working ion, you have to have structural compatibility between these two. It restricts the space of um, working ions and, and, uh, uh, and, and cathodes that you can uh, survey. So almost anything can be put in solution. So if you're dealing with a solution or a suspension, it greatly expands the range of materials that you can look at. And especially, I've put down here in the bottom an organic, symbol of an organic material. There are lots of organics that are virtually unexplored that you can use for both the electrolytes and for the redox couples. So that space is huge, and it doesn't cost much. So you can reduce the cost by going for the cheap uh, working ions and, and, and uh, redox couples, and you can store as much energy as you like because you pump this liquid electrolyte, the catholyte, out into a big tank out in the field and you don't care how big it is. So these are the advantages of these three ideas. We're going to apply lots of uh, tools, so characterization tools. Uh, we need to put everything into one brain or a few brains in order for this to work, and that's a central idea with Jay Caesar. Uh, we want to understand at the atomic and molecular level so we can build the battery from the bottom up. Uh, and we want to integrate the latest techniques in situ, time-resolved, multimodal characterization and make them work together. Here's one of the distinguishing features we bring, an electrochemical discovery lab. So this short sort of shows a, a loop, a closed loop, that shows how we'll intellectually proceed. I'll tell you in a minute about some genomes that we've uh, designed to look at uh, anode and cathode materials and also a very innovative electrolyte genome, look at the liquids. Uh, we'll take the results of those genomic surveys, choose the best materials, and synthesize them in this electrochemical discovery lab and move the synthesized thin film or single crystal, whatever it is, along a chain and measure six or seven different characterization steps, which we can rotate in and out, whatever we need, without ever losing the protective environment. So this gives you a way of comparing properties on the sample measured systematically and consistently, and materials measured by the same techniques, one against the other. So you can get the trends in what's going on. We'll also be able to do composites. Batteries are built on composites. So you want to put two materials together, look at the interface, look how they uh, work in uh, uh, in concert, uh, and the things that we like will move on to the cell design and prototyping and the techno-economic modeling stages. So we'll get certainly challenges out of this, which will go back to the basic science side, and we'll end up, we hope, with our prototypes from a technique like this. So I mentioned uh, genomes. Materials genomes have been around for five years or more, and they've already been applied to cathodes and anodes. We have a program, a very extensive program, that will continue that, extend that effort. But we're introducing something new, an electrolyte genome. 
So the electrolytes are a huge class of materials, probably bigger than what you would consider for anodes and cathodes, and you can tailor them. So here on the upper right, you see uh, quinoxaline uh, basic unit. You can hang ligands off it. Depending on what ligands you hang off it, you can make it either insoluble or highly soluble. You can make it very electroactive or not at all electroactive. And in general, you can do this uh, with lots of uh, backbones and with lots of ligands. And you, you need a way, to a guide, to help you figure out what that space looks like. And that will be our electrolyte genome. So usually genomes are not applied to liquids. The problems are totally different. You have, for example, a salvation shell that you see in the lower right. When you have uh, doubly uh, charged ions, the salvation shell is very different than when it's singly, singly charged. And that salvation shell, as it moves into an anode or a cathode, has to get lost. And the central ion has to be transferred across an SEI into, if it's an intercalation material, into the intercalation host. So those are the kinds of things that we're going to look at with our electrolyte genome. Uh, so here's our uh, mnemonic again, our, our visual. Uh, let's talk about the systems analysis and translation. We'll design on the computer, again, from the bottom up, knowing the materials and their performance and their cost how a battery system composed of, let's say, three of the materials would work. And we'll look for two metrics. One metric is performance. Will it help us meet the 555? Uh, and the second one is, so that's the first five. And the second one is manufacturing cost. So will it help us meet the second five? So we'll know before we actually make these batteries what to expect. And as I said earlier, we have 20 designs. We'll move four of them forward. The other 16 will ask, why didn't they work? Uh, and we'll find the weak link in that system, and we'll send that problem back to the basic science side and say, here's the issue with this battery. Make it work. And this is a thing that you can't do unless you have a single organization that talks to itself across this R&D spectrum. So that's the uh, battery on a computer. It's a little bit like materials on a computer. So the genomes will do the same thing for us at the materials level. The techno-economic modeling does it at the battery systems level. And we'll move the successful ones onto cell design and prototyping. Uh, and we have a new idea there. So I was mentioning these transitional development teams. You see a circle, a ring, with four colors. Each one of those four colors represents a step in the Jay Caesar diagram. So the basic science side, the techno-economic modeling side, of course, the prototypers and the commercial development. And they'll all, this team will look at everything uh, in the prototype. We'll want to make the prototypes, but we'll also want to break the prototypes. So why do they fail? Why don't they work better? And this team will go after those failures as well as successes. And once again, send the failures back to the basic science side and say, here's why it failed. Help us make this better. And again, that's an, a feature that you don't get unless you have a highly interactive organization. So we're going to, another feature, we're going to kick off our translational development teams on day one. They've already started with the idea of going after a magnesium intercalation battery and a, non a kind of non-aqueous re redox flow battery, again, to get the system working and develop those challenges, not that we expect these prototypes to be our final ones. Here's some pictures of the prototyping teams and the parts of Jay Caesar that they represent. Uh, all smiling and ready to go and, in fact, already working. Um, we have a very interesting intellectual property plan, which was completely signed before our proposal was submitted last May. It has uh, two, at least two, interesting features. First feature, no exclusive licenses. So we're not going to uh, be giving anybody a break. If one of our commercial partners works with us to develop some of the IP, of course, they may get special treatment, a, a slightly more favorable deal uh, on the, uh, at, the, at the end of the process, but they won't get an exclusive license, and everyone has agreed to that. The other interesting feature is that, by agreement, Argonne will be the negotiating agent, so an outside entity that wants to come in and uh, pick up some IP, IP doesn't have to talk to all 14 partners. They can talk to just one uh, agent who will, of course, consult with the other partners. So we hope that this will... Uh, accelerate uh, the transition to manufacturing. So I want to emphasize now that 
uh, the three concepts I talked about, multivalent intercalation, chemical transformation, and non aqueous redox flow, are not battery technologies. These are concepts. We want to find out everything we can about the way they operate, the phenomena, and the materials. And we expect that the batteries we make will draw from all three of these threads. So they will integrate features from every one of those three concepts. So here is a battery that we might make. So on the left-hand side, you see it might be a multivalent metal like magnesium, which serves as the anode. We'll take an electrolyte from our electrolyte genome and our electrochemical discovery lab uh, to transfer that ion to the other side. We may have a flowable electrode. So the cathode might be a liquid, not a solid. Uh, and immediately, you see I mean, they may have chemical reactions, of course, taking place in that solution or suspension. So immediately, you see that we draw from all three concepts. So we expect our batteries to be really quite innovative. And finally, I want to share with you this idea that J. Caesar is a microcosm of, of, of DOE's uh, spectrum from discovery to, uh, to deployment. And here you see our, our uh, J. Caesar, again, visual with the basic science on the left, the discovery science, the battery design in the middle, the prototyping, and the transfer to deployment on the right. And on this uh, lower strip, I'm showing you words that DOE uses to describe itself. So on the left-hand side, grand challenges. I'd like to understand why this works. I don't know what the application may be, but it's an important challenge that we are now able to do. Uh, we will access anything that comes out of the grand challenge effort in DOE, the science effort. We have our own discovery science teams. How do batteries work? What are the phenomena? What are the materials? We have use-inspired basic research. So that means I'd like to make the cathode better. How do, I, how do I achieve that? What do I have to do to make the cathode better? Right? And, uh, and of course, there's basic science there. So everything you see on the left is phenomena-based, uh, discovery-based. How does it work? Everything you see on the right is performance-based. I want it to work better. So the applied research, uh, give me another 10% in performance or another 50%. And for commercial deployment, technology maturation uh, uh, and manufacturing, we'll work with our partners starting now uh, to make that, to help them to make that happen. So this is quite a new idea. And Steve Chu uh, and his colleagues, and of course, based on Bell Labs and the uh, uh, the bio, uh, Bioenergy Research Centers, which preceded us by about five years, uh, these two models. Uh, and we're very hopeful that it'll work. It's the interaction that counts. I've shared this with others. I think our biggest challenge actually is not brains. I think we have a lot of smart people and smart organizations on the team. Our biggest challenge is communication. We have to make this communication happen two ways across this R&D spectrum. But if we can do that, then I have every confidence that we'll uh, be able to accelerate the process. That's a key goal, number one. And number two, achieve our 555 goals. So thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, we're open for questions. I can hear you. Okay. <laughs> Goals. I really applaud you for being so aggressive and, and forward looking. How do people who might have things to interject into the process get involved or interject their ideas? Um, by what mechanisms do they exist? You mentioned a yearly workshop, for example. Yes. Could you speak more about that? So, uh, connecting with the community is very important. And in fact, we have two people. Uh, Mike Thackeray and Khalil Amin, whose job is to connect. So Mike uh, talks more to the basic science side and Khalil to the more commercial side, but they, of course, share everything. So uh, anyone who would like to connect can connect with those two guys. Of course, uh, so I, I'm the director. I have three deputy directors, Nina Markovich for basic science, Venkat Srinivasan at Berkeley for design and integration, and uh, Jeff Chamberlain at Argonne for prototyping. Talk to any one of us. 
So we've already, so our affiliates, for example, grown from 40 when we submitted our proposal to probably 45 now. We are adding with, there are criteria, not, not everyone is an affiliate, you have to bring something to the table, but that's a way to join. So uh, there's lots of ways, and it's kind of informal at this stage, but please do contact us. As, concerning the affiliates workshop, we're expecting the first one to happen toward the end of the summer. So we need to have a little time to get organized, to have some results to report on, and some progress, and refine our goals going forward. But we would invite not only our affiliates, but others who are interested uh, to come to that workshop. So please contact us. Thank you very much. Uh, very fascinating research. And I was hoping you might be able to clarify something related to deployment on one of your early slides when you uh, discussed your goals, there was a figure that I believe said $100 per kilowatt hour. Right. And I'm not sure I'm thinking about dollars per kilowatt hour in the right context here. or uh, Because if it's $100 per kilowatt hour from a deployment standpoint, that's, um, needless, <laughs> to say the least, a, a tough sell. If it's $100 per megawatt hour, I could deploy that system, but could you clarify that, uh, that for us? So that, uh, if you look at the cost of uh, lithium ion batteries, which is sort of the, the, the standard in the community, that $100 a kilowatt hour would be about a factor of five lower than what you can do now. So I'm talking about commercial batteries, I'm not talking about batteries that are you know, research batteries that if it were manufactured could uh, achieve that goal. There, it's really about $500 per kilowatt hour now for commercial batteries. So that our goal is a factor of five. It's, it, let me clarify that. It's the cost of the battery, of the uh, capacity of storage of the battery, okay? Not, it's not the cost of the electricity, okay? I think right. that's what he was saying. Yes. I have I, a stupid question. I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't yeah, right. <laughs> um, you talked a little, I, I was, in the middle of getting breakfast out back there, so I maybe didn't hear it correctly, but, but you talked about uh, perhaps using deeper chemical bonds to get more energy storage. Yeah. And, and the issue here is not so much, it's gotta have a reversibility, a minimum over potential. Yes, when you're charging it, you can get, try to get it up a bigger hill, but it has to be stable. The stable stability has to be like 5 kT. It doesn't have to be greater than that. But there's other requirements, and so my question is, in your, uh, numerical searches and, and your engineer. How do you do things like that, and especially with the electrolytes, which is, in, as we both know, is one of the most critical things to give uh, the ultimate high temperature safety of the battery. How do you go searching for those type of properties? So there, uh, that remains to be done, and uh, we're setting that up now. So it's easy enough to, to search on standard properties, like you know, how much energy can be stored and what's the difference uh, in energy level. Things like safety, uh, reversibility, can you really go backwards? The problem, classic problem with lithium air, hard to make it go backwards. Uh, and, and safety where you don't really know how you're going to achieve the safety. So in the present generation of lithium ion batteries, there's two cathodes. Uh, one has a runaway reaction that starts at a much lower temperature than the other. Yeah, and uh, so you wanna use the phosphate one if, you're, if you want to be safe. You want to use the cobalt one if you want to get the maximum energy density. But uh, the difference in temperature at where they start to run away is a safety feature. So things like that we could, in principle, do with our genomes and with our computer modeling. Uh, and of course, everything that we do, it's only, um, it's only a guide. Everything that you think you're going to achieve, you have to actually achieve. So we would do it in the laboratory. But those are uh, absolutely critical issues. So I don't think either one of these transformations will take place if you just meet the technological goals, you have to meet, in a sense, the social goals. People have to be comfortable with it. And one of those, of course, is safety. Do we have another question? Yes, two questions. Uh, one, you had the two different teams planned out. Will they be cross-pollinating one another? And you know, the one individual on one team might have the key idea to fix another concept on the other team? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, it's up here. So, we need to talk this way along the R&D spectrum, but we also need to talk up and down, especially on the left-hand side there. So the three concept teams, they actually talk all the time. And in fact, they're not uh, disjoint. 
So every team has uh, several, in some cases many, members in common with other teams. So it's not only a question, that makes the communication easier. It's not just a matter of talking, it's thinking inside your head, ah, this is an issue uh, for, the, for multivalent and percolation, but I'm on the chemical transformation team as well, and I think we can solve it there. So you raise a good point, and with the uh, sort of mixed membership, uh, we're trying to address that. And the second question is that this is a great uh, incubator for the ideas and the technology, and our only U.S. Uh, partners and associates included, and how do we protect this IP from becoming mass-produced in China, so to speak, uh, funded by taxpayer dollars? So certainly all the, all the funding from DOE goes only to U.S. companies, and we've, we've set that up as, on purpose. Uh, and uh, we're very careful of uh, disclosing IP to others. So there are rules about this, and we, you know, we have to make it available to everyone. Uh, but uh, we are certainly mindful of the fact that we want to keep this uh, manufacturing in the States if we can. So if you look at what happened with lithium-ion batteries, actually was invented here. Uh, and then it migrated to Asia for various reasons, partly because that's where personal electronics uh, boomed and emerged. And it's going to be hard to get that back. I don't think we can do it. However, beyond lithium ion, nobody owns it yet. So we have an opportunity to, let's say, not repeat some of the uh, experiences of the past and perhaps do, some, do something different. And that's certainly high on our minds. Yeah, I, I guess the tension or what you want to balance is what if overseas resources have technology that might be very beneficial to include in this. So we, you, know, you wouldn't not want necessarily to exclude that either. So uh, it can't be two ways and still be fair. Yeah, I completely agree. And in fact, we've already been contacted by Toyota with some interesting ideas and we're thinking about some cooperation, but it, it needs to be thoroughly understood how it would work. So good point. Okay, one last question. Uh, well, my question is uh, not quite directly related to what you're doing, which is amazing, of course. But I think one of the factors that you've put in here uh, is uh, the power density. And uh, so it, this solution is probably ap more applicable for transportation-related uh, applications rather than the power right. grid. And if, supposing there was a solution for a power grid, which, is, uh, which meets other criteria except the uh, power density and the weight, would you, how would you entertain that? We would go after it aggressively. So I think the, car, the, the targets for the car are pretty clear. You want a high energy density so you can go far, low enough cost so it competes with gas-driven you know, the, uh, cars, and it has to be safe. So it, there are three criteria, and if you meet those three, you do it. For the grid, there are probably 20 different applications, and they range all the way from a few seconds of storage because a cloud goes over and obscures the, uh, the solar farm uh, to a day of storage because the wind doesn't blow that day, and if we're getting 30% of our power from the wind, we have to back it up some way. So, and everything in between. So it's a much richer space. And in fact, when I went to ComEd in Chicago in, in, uh, in January to give a talk like this, I said, tell me your applications challenges. What is it you want from the next generation battery? And I, I actually didn't get an answer because they weren't ready for the question. But that's the kind of question where <laughs> we, we want to get the answer to and we will get the answer to as we go forward. And then we can start to use this fundamental knowledge that we develop on the left up here to solve the transportation battery problem and the many grid battery problems, even though very different batteries are needed, they'll rely on the same basic technology. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.